Okay, let's get back to this. I know it's been a long time. So the last time we were here, we talked about repayment, and we've got these sinking funds, and in order for you to be able to buy back those bonds, they're gonna take the money from the sinking fund, and if the bonds are traded on the open market, all they gotta do is go out and buy them just like you would buy stock. But if the bonds are not traded on the open market, then we have to have what's called a call provision. And here's what that call provision allows the borrower or issuer to do. By the way, very important that you understand that it is the borrower or issuer that has this option. It's the borrower or the issuer that has this option. And the borrower or the issuer can force the bondholder or lender to sell back their bonds. They can force them to sell back their bonds. So in the beginning they borrowed the money, the issuer borrows the money by selling bonds and now they can force the bond holder to sell that bond back to them. Now they can't just force them to sell it back to them at any number. It has to be the face value plus what's called a call premium. A call premium. And so that's an amount over and above the face value that they've got to pay. And it's usually something like one year's worth of coupons. One year's worth of coupons. Okay, so what does this do? Well, oh, so and one more thing. Sometimes at the very beginning they have what's called a deferred call provision, which says I, the bond issuer, cannot exercise this option for two years or three years, whatever it is. Sometimes those are there. But Here's the problem. If you're a bond holder, would you want the bond issuer to exercise this option? No. No. Why? Because we're kind of learning about this in um, international finance. Oh, excellent. But it's basically because they're going to be paying more for it, or they'll have to shell it more. Yeah, okay, so let's think about it this way. When is it good for them to be willing to pay, say, $1,120 for a bond? When the market value is low, more than, right? So if I'm, if I'm the issuer and I'm willing to pay $1,120 for this bond, what does that mean the thing's actually worth out in the market? If it was worth $1,110, wouldn't I just go out and buy it, right? And so if I'm going to do this call provision on a publicly traded bond, what it means is that interest rates have dropped so low that this bond has become so premium that it's now worth more than face value plus the call premium. And so what that means is maybe this bond was worth $1,130 and now I'm going to force you to sell it to me for $1,120. Are you happy? No. And that's the first of your disappointments. The second is when you turn around to try to reinvest that money. Because what caused that bond to be desirable to be called? Low interest rates. And now you've got to take that money and reinvest, reinvest it. Do you think you're going to get the same kind of return you were getting on that previous bond? Absolutely not. And so this is why this, this is risky for the bond holder. It's risky for the bond holder. Now, if we're going to make things riskier for the bond holder, what do you think that does to the yield to maturity on these bonds? Yeah, it's got to be higher. It's got to be higher because it's riskier. So let me walk through that one more time. It's risky for the bond holder because of reinvestment risk because if they get called out, if they're forced to sell their bonds, they're gonna to have to reinvest that money and they're gonna to have to reinvest it at a lower rate because that's what caused this whole thing to happen in the beginning was the, the rates have fallen. And so now you've got the problem of reinvesting your money and you're gonna get less income as a result. Yeah. Isn't that part of to reduce the risk is to have it deferred? Yeah, and that's, it does help to reduce the risk. So, if you had a two-year deferred call, that would have a lower yield to maturity than one without a deferred call. If I had a three-year deferred call, it would have a lower yield to maturity than one with a two-year deferred call. I can tell you pay good attention in Doug's class. Good for you. It's online. It's online! Oh my goodness! So I had uh, Dr. Witte, he was my professor at Mizzou. Yeah, I actually had him in class. And, he, and when, he, when he's live, he speaks very quietly. 
and basically the whole room has to be very silent in order for people to hear it. But it works, right? He'll just start teaching and then everyone just shuts up because they can't hear him otherwise. Okay, so let's see. Now, let me tell you a story to hammer this home. This was in the Wall Street Journal. This is a true story. You know, I tell you, I will tell you if I'm telling you lies. This one's a true story. Of course, it, I've probably forgotten some names and whatnot. But here's the deal. Uh, little old ladies, uh, women tend to outlive their male partners. That's fact number one. Number two, um, these women were retired and they're living in Florida and they are living off of bond coupons. So they got Social Security, but then the big part of their money comes from bond coupons. And so the, the husbands had bought these bonds back when interest rates were high. And the coupons were about 12% per year. How much per year does a $1,000 bond with a 12% coupon pay? Yeah, $120 a year. And so each and every one of their bonds was paying them $120 a year. Okay, so then we have the September 11th terrorist attacks and we're concerned that the economy is going to take a dive because of that. So what does the Federal Reserve do? The Federal Reserve pushes a lot of money out there, lower interest rates to get people to go out there and, and maybe take some risk to try to get the economy going. And so what does that do? It makes borrowing cheaper. So the next time that these corporations go out to borrow money, do you think they're paying 12% coupons? Ah, oh, they were 6% coupons. How much does a bond make every year with a 6% coupon? 60 bucks. And so basically it cut these women's, it would have cut these women's bond income in half. And so of course they go down and visit their brokers. And the brokers, they're, 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 and they're giving the broker a hard time. By the way, is it the broker's fault? No. They're giving the broker a hard time. And he's like, well, he says, we've got these bonds from the same issuer. They're very similar and they pay a coupon rate of six and a quarter. So $62.50 a year versus $60 a year. And the little old ladies say, well, you know, it's extra 250, it's better than nothing, we'll take it. And so they buy the bonds. And then um, a few years down the road, we have another economic problem and the feds lower interest rates again. And the little old ladies then receive these weird correspondences from the bond issuers. It's a check and it says, your bonds have been called. Thank you for your, you know, lending us money. Have a great life or whatever. Now, the little old ladies don't know what to make of this. At first they think it's free money. But of course, then they realize there's no such thing, right? And so what do they do? They pile in the Buick because you know it's a Buick, right? They pile in the Buick and they head down to the broker's office and say, what the hell? And the broker says, well, you remember I told you that these bonds were a little different? He says, a little different. The reason you were getting the extra money is because they had a call provision. And then of course they get mad at the broker and they, then he says, did you actually read the bond prospectus? What do you think the answer is? No. And so the little old ladies are mad and then they have to reinvest their money. But now what's happened to interest rates again in the meantime? They're even lower than they were before. So now these little old ladies are buying bonds with 5% coupons. How much does a 5% coupon pay every year? 50. And their original bond was paying 120. They are down more than 50% on their income. And the real heartbreaker line in the whole article is at the end where one little old lady says, it's gotten so bad, I can only afford to eat at the country club once per week now. Isn't that awful? Okay, so there is your story of why call provisions are dangerous for bondholders, why bondholders would demand higher yield to maturities for an otherwise identical non-callable bond. Questions? Okay. Now let's talk about protective Covenants. Um, a covenant is a, a promise or an agreement, and these are things that have been put into the bond indenture to protect the bond holders, and they're the lenders. Remember, we said that it's actually the borrower that writes the contract. It's not like when you go to the bank 
In that case, the lender writes the contract. Well, in this case, the borrower is writing the contract. And so the borrower has to choose what to put into that contract. So what kinds of things would they choose to put into the contract? It would be things that would lower the yield or lower the risk of the bond and would therefore lower the yield to maturity, the cost to borrow to the borrower. Now, what kinds of things would you put in there? If you didn't ever plan on doing X, you could promise not to do X and the bondholders would reward you with a lower cost to borrow. And so the first set of these things that you want to put in there are things that you would either never plan to do, you could promise not to do those, or things that you plan always to do, you could promise to do those things. And as a result, the bondholders reward you with a lower cost of borrowing. So that's the whole idea here. And so we've got two kinds of covenants that we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about negative covenants, and that's what you're not supposed to do as the borrower, and then positive covenants, which is what the bond issuer must do. So let's talk about some negative covenants. And by the way, this is like the buffet. The borrower is going along, and they're like, ooh, I like this covenant, and they put it on the plate. And they go a little further down, and they're like, mm, no. And then they go a little further down, and it's that awful green jello that your grandma makes with the pineapples and the carrot scrapings on top. No, right? You go and you take the things you want and you leave the things you don't. So don't think that all of these things are going to be in every contract. They're not. Okay, so first of all, a negative covenant that is usually there that the firm must limit dividend payments. And usually it's limited to a percentage of the earnings per share. So a percentage of the net income that they're allowed to pay out as dividends. Why do you think we would want to limit the firm from, or limit the firm from paying too much in dividends? Say again? Because then you're giving too much money away. Yeah, and so it's, dividends come out of cash. Where do your bond coupons come out of? Cash. And so if they spend too much on dividends, they don't have enough to pay your coupons. Worst case scenario, if I were a real shyster, I could uh, tell you folks, I'm like, hey, I'd like to sell you these bonds and I'd make them look nice, but they wouldn't have this provision in it. You wouldn't notice it because you're not going to read the perspective. You buy the bonds and then I immediately pay out the entire proceeds of the bond issues, bond issue to the shareholders and declare bankruptcy. What have I done? I've just stolen the money from the bondholders and given it to the shareholders. Now that's an extreme example, but that's why this would be a good covenant to put in there if you weren't planning on being almost criminal. Number, uh, number two is that firms cannot pledge assets to other lenders. So when you have a house, you can borrow money against it. So let's, uh, I think my house is worth, who knows, it keeps changing, right? Let's just say 400,000. My house is worth 400,000. And I come to Mr. Burstein and I say, I've got this house that's worth $400,000. I own it outright. Would you loan me 250,000 against it? No. He knows I'm a shyster. I'm <laughs> Mr. Close. Okay, so I've got this house that's worth $400,000. Would you loan me 250,000 against it? No. Oh my goodness. You know, if you guys were loan officers, no money would ever get lent. Okay, so is anybody willing to loan me the money? Okay, so I've got, uh, so I'm gonna, you're gonna loan me the money, and I'm gonna say thank you. Now, uh, then I'll go to um, uh, Ms. Pomeroy, and I will say, and, and she didn't hear me make this deal with her neighbor, uh, Ms. Pomeroy, I've got this, this great house, you can come look at it, you can have it appraised. Uh, would you loan me 250000 against it? She's going to say yes, too. And so will Jared, what's your last name? Breyer. Yeah, and he will, too. Sorry, Mr. Breyer. Okay, so uh, we will have all three of these people, they've loaned me money, but they don't realize it. Now, I've borrowed $750,000 against a house that's only worth $400,000. Okay, so what happens? Um, first, we have, uh, he finds out. And he goes to the door to uh, 
take over the property because I have defaulted. And while he's there, Ms. Pomeroy comes up the sidewalk. And he says, what, what the hell are you doing here? She says, I'm here to get my house. And right about that time, Mr. Yeah, I, I, I would not place bets on that fight. <laughs> and about that time, Mr. Breyer comes sauntering up the sidewalk. He's like, hey, what are you guys doing? And they're like, we're here to collect our house. And now it's a three-way fight, and that's what this looks like, right? It's a three-way fight. So this is why we're going to promise not to pledge assets to other lenders is because it makes for less fighting at the bankruptcy. Plus, there is now enough assets to actually cover the debt in the event of default. So that's why we do that. Firm cannot merge with another firm. Now, once again, not all firms can, can use all of these. There are a lot of firms that their business model is all about merging. Uh, if you saw Apple go for uh, a year without doing any sort of acquisitions, uh, it would be very, very odd, right? And Google's the same way, and so uh, those companies won't. But if you are in a position where you are not interested in merging, then you can throw this in here. And let's talk about why this, by the way, all of these things protect the bond holders. Write that down. All of these things protect the bond holders. All of these things protect the bond holders with the goal of reducing the risk, with the goal of reducing the risk so they'll demand less return. All of these things protect the bond holder. And it's so funny because I, one of the, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you one of the questions on the exam right now, or some form of it, because of course I have very different versions. But who is protected by protective covenants? And the students will always say the bond issuer. Wrong. It's the bond holder. The reason the bond issuer puts them into the covenant is so they can get a lower cost of borrow. Okay. So let's get back to why you don't want me to merge. So I've got this group of bondholders over here. My personal business, I have a dairy. And that's where they get the milk out of the cows, right? So I've got this dairy, and I have a contract with the Springfield School District. And they're going to pay me basically cost plus 10% for all the milk needs of the entire school district. By the way, Springfield is the second biggest district in the state or something like that. Anyway, so pretty good, right? So I've got uh, people are going to keep making kids, and kids are going to keep drinking milk. So this is fairly safe. So I sell my bonds to this crowd, and I sell them at four. Per, they got four percent coupons, and you guys are happy. You're willing to pay face value, and that means that the yield of maturity you're placing on these things is four percent. Now my brother-in-law owns a nuclear waste disposal company. And he, by the way, do you think that's uh, riskier or safer? It's riskier, not only physically, but financially, because the regulation hits them and they may be out of business tomorrow. Who knows? Um, he has sold bonds to this group of investors over here. And of course, they demand higher return on his bonds. And so you guys are getting 8% coupons. And that's exactly enough to satisfy your demanded return. So how much are these bonds selling for in your world? 8% coupons, they're selling at par. I, I, I guess I just told you that, right? If, if that coupon is enough to satisfy your demand and return, then you're willing to pay par value, right? Okay, now, let's talk about what happens when I merge the dairy with the nuclear waste disposal group. Now, and they're equal sized, by the way, so when I put them together, uh, the the risk for the company's overall now demands a return of 6%. 6%. And so you guys, your bonds, have these $80 a year coupons. Now suddenly, they're only required to return 6%. So what's going to happen to your bond prices, the value of your bonds? They're going to go up, right? They're going to go up because now your coupons are more than enough to satisfy your demand of return, so they're going to become premium bonds. And so far, everybody's happy, except for one thing. You guys are, except are you getting $40 a year coupons? Wake up. You're getting $40 a year coupons, and now you want 6% return. 
what happens to your bond values? They go down. In fact, this is a direct wealth transfer from the bondholders of the risky firm to the bondholders of the safe firm. That's all it is. It's a direct wealth transfer from the bondholders of the risky firm to the bond oh, from the sorry from the bondholders of the safe firm to the bondholders of the risky firm. That's all it is. And so, if you were going to buy a bonds of a safer company, you would for sure want to have this in there that would give you peace of mind that they weren't going to do something crazy like merging with a nuclear waste disposal company. Questions? Okay, now, firm cannot sell, lease major assets without lender approval. So let's assume we're talking about an unsecured bond. How do the uh, owners of unsecured bonds get paid at bankruptcy? Well, the, the assets of the firm have to be sold, and then that's the pot of money from which they're able to pay out these unsecured debt holders. Does that make sense? Now, what happens if along the way they've actually sold these things? Now there aren't any assets left to back up the debt. Does that make sense? Is that, is that, is that a good thing for you? as a bondholder? No, no. So you would like for them to have this in the covenant that they can't sell or lease as major assets. Now, of course, there's gonna be a, like a, a limit, right? You, you don't wanna hamstring them, like when they wanna sell the, trade the company pickup truck in. They, you, you don't want a bond covenant that's gonna keep from doing that, but that's why we say major assets. And the firm cannot issue additional long-term debt. I think this is something I did not hit hard enough back when we were in Chapter 3. And that is, who would you rather loan money to? Someone that owes a lot of money or someone who doesn't owe money at all? Doesn't owe a lot of money, right? You don't want them to owe a lot of money because in a, if, if you're the only debt holder, you're pretty much almost guaranteed to get paid, right? Because any money they've got, they can use to pay you. But what if they've got more than one debt holder? Well, now they've got fixed payments to two different groups of people, and it just keeps growing, right? And at some point, basically, it's entirely possible that their cash flows will not be enough to meet those fixed debt payments, and that's where we end up with bankruptcy for both people and companies. Now, if I were the first person to ever loan money to these people, I would be pleased for them to throw this covenant in there because it's their way of saying we don't plan to go out and raise more debt therefore making your position more risky. By the way, when you, so let's say I, I issue my first bonds to you with a coupon of 6%. The next coupon, the next bond that I issue probably has to have a higher yield maturity because we know it's riskier because after all, it's not for a company that's 100% equity, it's for a company that's also got some debt in the capital structure. And so the more and more debt I raise, the, the higher that yield of maturity has to be all things equal. And so then what happens to the value of the bonds, the original bonds, those ones with the 6% coupon? Well, now that the yield of maturity out there in the market for our, the bonds of this company is 7%, now the value of those original bonds has fallen. And so this is another reason I'm not interested in allowing these people to issue more debt. Now, is this a common one? No. And the reason it's not a common one is because, you know, like General Electric, they uh, mature debt and borrow new money all the time. It goes on all the time. Uh, it's part of their business model. They couldn't, they couldn't do this. But if you can, and it is part of your business model, you can promise not to issue additional debt, and as a result, your bond holders will not require as much return from you. It will lower your borrowing costs. Questions? Okay. By the way, if the borrower defaults, or if the borrower breaks any of these rules, they haven't defaulted against the bond by, against the borrowers by not paying, but they are in technical default because they've broken one of the covenants. And as soon as they are in technical default, then the lenders to them, the bondholders, have the right to take control of the assets. And so you could basically 
get forced into bankruptcy even if you were still making the payments if you were in technical default. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, at that point, what's more likely to happen? It's more likely that the uh, lenders will get together and they'll negotiate some, some new terms or something, something to make this work out because, after all, there, there are a lot of what we call deadweight losses when you push someone into bankruptcy. Okay, so those are some, but not all, of the negative covenants you might see. So now let's <clears throat> be more positive. First of all, firms must maintain NWC. What's NWC? Yeah, networking capital at or above a stated minimum level. Why would bondholders care about networking capital? Yeah, so remember that networking capital, we want it to be for sure positive because if it's negative, it means the firm can't make its payments over the next year. And here's something that you need to know. It's not just bondholders that can force the firm into bankruptcy. Suppliers can too. And so even if the bondholders were getting paid, if these people were not paying their suppliers, the suppliers could force them into bankruptcy and we end up right back where we would have if we had forced them into bankruptcy. And so to protect against that, we want to say, look, you guys need to keep at least this much in networking capital. Of course, keep in mind this is the borrower promising up front that we are going to keep this much in networking capital. And then the second one says, we must periodically furnish audited financial statements to the bondholders. So a couple of things here. Why are the bondholders interested in the financial statements of the firm? Shows how the company's doing, right? Shows the financial condition of the company. And by the way, how am I going to know whether they're maintaining their minimum networking capital if I don't have the financial statements, right? That's like it's uh, here at the university, the accounting is really weird and what we would call opaque, meaning not transparent. And uh, anytime I say, well, where did this money come from? And they'll tell me, oh, they give me a, I'm like, well, how do, you know, where's the documentation? And they say, just trust us. Right? And, and I don't have any reason to believe these people are ripping, ripping you or the taxpayers off. But if, can, if a company says, just trust us, should you pay, should you think that's okay? No, right? We know people are scumbags. Okay. Now, that's the first thing, is you've got to have financial statements. And then, secondly, audited financial statements. Why are, by the way, what is an audited financial statement? What's different? What's, yeah? It's professionally done by a third party. Yeah, it's professionally done by a third party. And so I'm the bond holder, you're the bond issuer, and we've got this person over here, and he is looking over, he or she is looking over the financial statements of the bond issuer. Um, and now, of course, are they, if, you, if it's got a clean audit, does that mean it's necessarily good? No. Auditors come in, they take a random sampling, and then they come up with uh, a, a report based on what they found in that random sample. So it's possible that they could miss things. And I think they always mention that in their audit opinions, that in our sampling we didn't find anything bad. Now here's the problem. Who pays the auditor? Oh, the company. Yeah, the company does. And so uh, I have my three accounting firms over here. And they all want my business. And Ms. Roll is currently my auditor. If she does something I don't like, what can I do? Fire her. Fire her. I go to Ms. Benioff and say, do you see what happened with Ms. Roll? You willing to play ball? By the way, am I paying her to do this work? Do you like money? Yeah, we all like money. If someone says no, there's something wrong with them. Okay, and so that, that this Benias gets into my financials and she thinks, sees something that's really, really out of the ordinary, and she comes to me and tells me about it, and I say, thank you so much for bringing that to my attention. I'll be sure to tell Ms. Knight when she becomes my auditor. What have I just said? Yeah! Or I said, I will fire you if this gets into the report. Now, you may think that I'm entirely jaded about such things, but I will tell you this. 
I've seen this one in person. A uh, company I was working at, it's a um, production factory, and we have the auditor there. And the auditor is about roughly your age, right? You can tell he's got a brand new suit, brand new shoes, and he's out there on the shop floor, and he totally sticks out like a sore thumb. I'm wearing a polo shirt, jeans, and steel toe boots, as is everybody else, and he's wearing a suit. And I see a guy from the warehouse run up to him. Eleven out, eleven dollar an hour warehouse hand, and that was decent money, I guess. But anyway, he says eleven hundred. So he comes up, and he says, "Are you the accountant?" And of course, this twenty-three-year-old guy says, "Why, well, yes, yes, I am." And the warehouse guy says, "These people have been letting shipments stack up on the back dock of incoming materials, and they are not receiving it in in a timely manner. Why would the company be doing that?" What are they trying to look, make look better on their financials? Yeah, inventory. By the way, we had goals for inventory turns. And the inventory turns were calculated based on the year-end inventory. And guess what? It was December 31st, right? All this stuff is sitting out there. What's going to happen on January 2nd? Because January 1st, you know, we're all sleeping in, right? What's going to happen January 2nd? What's going to happen with that? material. Oh, they're going to bring it in, right? And so basically they're artificially making the uh, in, uh, inventory low. <coughs> okay, so I see this guy and he pulls out his cell phone, and by the way it's 1997, and so it's like huge, right? And I see him making all these phone calls. And then I see him take off. Now, the rest of the story, I have to imagine what happened. And, but my imaginings are borne out by what happened in the end. So here's what I imagine happened. The young auditor goes to the site manager and says, I found this problem. They're not putting inventory in. And the site manager is, by the way, hoping someday to be a partner. So does he want to shake the tree too much? No. So what does he do? He says, oh, it's probably just this location. It's not material. What does material mean? Not that big of a deal. And in fact, I have a buddy who used to work for Arthur Anderson before they went kaput. And he was going to look at a Georgia Pacific paper plant. And he asked before he left, he says, boss, what's material? And the boss says, Son, if you drive up and that plant's missing, that's material. Everything else we can deal with. Is that the kind of person you want auditing your, your uh, bond issuer? Absolutely not. Okay, so he goes up front and, and he says, well, I figured you'd say that, so I called all their other facilities. And it turns out that Duncan, Oklahoma, New Iberia, Louisiana, Houston, Texas, Montrose, Scotland, Arboro, Scotland, uh, and there's some places in Angola, and by the way, Angola's in Africa. Um, all over the world, this is the same problem. They've been doing this all over the world, holding back on the inventory. Now, can the site manager any longer say that's not material? No, it's a systemic problem all throughout the company. So, what does the site manager do? He calls the head auditor down in Houston, and he tells the head auditor what's going on. And the head auditor agrees, this is serious. And so then the head auditor goes in to visit with the managers of the firm about the audit and tells them about this situation. And the managers in my imagined story say, wow, thanks for bringing that to our attention. By the way, while you're here, do you have any recommendations for a new auditor because we were thinking about hiring one? And what happens next? Do you think that situation showed up in the audit report? Absolutely not. I knew about it, and everyone at my facility knew about it all the way. And, and heck, the, the guy that was in charge of the audit down in Houston knew. By the way, that Houston office of Arthur Anderson was exactly the same one that did the books for Enron, right? So you're starting to see what the problem is. So why do I tell you this long story? Are financial statements better than no financial statements? Absolutely. Are audited financial statements better than straight up plain financial statements? Absolutely. By the way, don't ever trust a financial statement 
that someone just offers up to you that's not been audited because there is zero chance that it's right. There is zero chance. I know a guy that's a business broker and people want to come in and sell their businesses and they'll bring in their financial statements and he says, and I quote, I don't want to see that bullshit. He says, bring your tax forms in. Why do you think he wants to see their tax forms? Yeah, you're less likely to lie on your taxes, right? Because you don't want to go to prison because prison sucks. And so that's why he says, I don't even look at people's financial statements. He says, they're all just total crap. He says, look at the tax forms. Does that make sense? Okay. So, audited financial statements are better than just plain financial statements, but you still shouldn't trust them entirely. And then finally, firms must maintain any collateral or security in good condition. Um, you buy a car on credit Why, from, the, from the bank. You borrow money from the bank. Why would the bank be interested in you maintaining that car in good condition? Say again? That's the collateral, and if you don't pay, what are they going to have to do? They're going to take the car, and then what are they going to have to do? Sell it. Sell it. If the car's in bad condition, they might not get as much money out of it as you owe them. And so it's the same thing with these bonds. If we are um, building, we're giving someone money to build a new electric plant. All the, the user operator guides tell you exactly what needs to be done for maintenance on those. And so if that's going to be the collateral, then one of the things I could do is say we will maintain the equipment in accordance with the preventive maintenance guidelines as specified by the manufacturer. And that's a way to assure you, the bondholder, that if you have to take that, it's still going to be in good shape. You're still going to get your money out of it. Questions? Okay. Now, let's talk about bond ratings. I think your book just says that they represent um, default risk, but that is not quite true. It's actually a combination of default risk and the probability of recovery given default. Let's talk about those things. Default risk is the risk that they won't pay. And if you've got a company, the default risk among all of their bonds would probably be about the same. But there are secured bonds and there are unsecured bonds. Which one of those would have a, prior, a, 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 a higher probability that the bond holder would be able to get their money back, the secured bond or the unsecured bond? Secured. Yeah, the secured bond. And so we say that one has a higher probability of recovery given default. Therefore, the secured bond will have a higher bond rating than the unsecured bond. And so you can look across the bonds of a company and they can have a whole range of bond ratings based on uh, the secured or unsecured nature of it based on the, uh, the prospectus or the, the this covenant that we've talked about, these covenants. And so you can see that they'll have different bond ratings. So don't let that freak you out when you see different bond ratings for the same company. Now, who issues these ratings? Well, there are three companies. There's actually two big ones and a little one. There's S&P and there's Moody's. Those are the two big ones. And then there's the little guy, Fitch. Fitch is like, Fitch is kind of like Chrysler used to be, right? It's, it's a, the small trailing competitor. Okay, so these people will go out and for any important uh, big bond issues, they will automatically rate them without even uh, getting paid by the issuer. And the reason is they all want to be seen as players on these big bond issues. But what if you're a small bond issuer? Then you have to pay these people to rate your bonds. And now we wind up back in the same position that we were earlier where the issuer was paying the auditor. Well, now the issuer's paying the bond rating firm. So I'm going to come back here to my three favorites. Uh, as far as these competitive roles go. I've got this role, this Benioff, and this Knight, and now they are S&P, Moody, and I'm sorry, you have to be Fitch. Okay, so here's what's gonna happen. Uh, by the way, the top bond rating is AAA, right? 
And I'm going to show Ms. Roll my bonds. Ms. Roll, what kind of rating would you give my bonds? A. A, okay, so she's knocking me down a little bit. I get it, I'm shifty. Okay, now, the second question I'm going to ask you is how much are you going to charge me to rate these bonds? Just make up a number. Um, I don't know. Okay, don't ever do anything for less than $250,000. Okay. Okay. So, <laughs> 350,000. Okay. 300. Okay, very good. She's going to charge me 300,000. So I come to Moody's and I say, <clears throat> check out my bonds. What would you, how would you rate these bonds? Triple A is the best, double A, then what she gave me? Um, double A. Ooh, double A. I'm liking her already. Okay. Now, how much are you going to charge me? 500,000. 500,000. Man, she's smart, right? She, she knows she can get more money if she gives me a higher rate. Okay, Fitch. <laughs> Check out my bonds. What are you going to give me? Triple A. Triple A. That's what you gave me. You give me a double A. Triple A. Whoa, she's smart. Okay, how much are you going to charge me? A million dollars. A million dollars. Oh, oh. Breaking my Well, anyway. <laughs> You're really hurting me. Okay, so <laughs> I'm going to. Who, who do you think I'm going to go with? Rita. I'm going with her, right? This is this is jump change compared to the money I'm going to save on my financing costs by having a triple A. This is the problem. We end up with a situation where these people are basically just competing for the bond rating business, and there are two ways to do that. Number one is by the rating that you give, the higher, the more competitive you are. And number two is by the money. If you two had both said AAA, I would have just gone with the one with the lower money, right? Does that make sense? By the way, typically you don't know what each other's charging, right? Okay. So that is why we say that a bond with a rating is better than a bond with no rating, but it's just like audited financial statements. It's not foolproof. It's not bulletproof. And I'll give you an example of that. During the financial crisis, well, I should say the last financial crisis because it looks like we've got another one brewing. Um, the last financial crisis was all about these mortgage-backed securities. And afterwards, when they're doing this, figuring out what was happening badly, <coughs> these three people came before Congress and they said, yeah, we really didn't know how risky these things were. We had no good models to measure the risk of them, so we just gave them all AAA. Is that what we want from our bond rating agencies? No. How many of these uh, rating agencies do you think the government went after? One. And I can tell you which one. S&P had recently downgraded the U.S. government debt from AAA to double A plus or something like that. The other two didn't. Who do you think got the heat? S&P. People are scumbags all the world over. Okay. Let's see. Um, and I will give you an example here. A friend of mine, Janet, uh, she was in charge of treasury for city utility. You know, those are the people that you pay for electricity and things like that. Uh, they were building a new power plant southwest of the city and they were going to issue a bunch of bonds. And she was talking to the investment banker, and the investment banker said, you should have these bonds rated. And Janet says, why would I do that? He says, well, if you have the bonds rated, then uh, people outside of your area are going to be willing to buy them. So if you were here in, in Springfield, you know City Utilities is financially solid. You know it's a good company. You, you're not concerned. You're going to give them a, a good rate. But do you think people in New York City have, do you think they even know that we exist out here? No. The only way that they're going to look at those bonds and think that they're worth buying is if they have a rating on them. And so City Utilities actually had to go out and hire one of these three firms to rate those bonds. And they ended up getting S&P to rate them. And the idea is that the rating on the bond is going to cost you less than the reduction that you receive as a result in your financing costs. And so it's totally worth it to get your bonds rated. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, let's see. So we've got these uh, 
ratings tiers. And uh, the first one is called investment grade. And investment grade are what is what university endowments and pension funds and charitable endowments, those people are all allowed to invest in investment grade bonds. And then the lower tier are called junk. Does junk sound good? No. Who are my marketing people here? Are you marketing guy? Okay. So I'm gonna, I, you're going to be my consultant. I'm going to come to you and I'm going to say, yeah, I got these risky bonds and they're, they're so risky that we have to pay a, a higher rate on them. And currently the name is junk. Does that sound appealing to you from a marketing standpoint? No. He says no. And then he says, well, tell me more. Tell me more about these bonds. I say, these bonds are so risky that they have to yield a very high amount. And he says, tell me about more about this yield. And I say, well, that means that they have to return a lot. So they're going to pay out a lot of money. And he says, ah, I have a new name for your bonds. We'll call them high yield bonds. Doesn't that sound better than junk, right? And so in the 80s, we stopped calling these, we stopped selling these as high yield bonds and we started calling them junk bonds. In the beginning, all junk bonds were fallen angels. What's a fallen angel? In the beginning, people would only issue investment grade debt. And uh, if there were junk bonds out there, it was simply because this investment uh, grade bond had fallen from grace because something happened at the company that made it riskier, and so now the bond rating gets lower. And so all of your junk bonds were fallen angels. And then a guy in the 1980s comes along, his name's Michael Milken, and he says, wait a minute, we could actually issue bonds as junk from the day they're born, original issue junk. And as long as, and they're fair, priced fairly, right? Because those high yields make up for the risk. And so uh, people will actually buy these. But of course, Michael says, we're gonna call them high yield bonds instead. And so this is actually what led to the uh, big corporate takeover thing of the 1980s was people were able to issue these original issue junk bonds and they were able to use that money to take over other companies. And so we had a lot of consolidations during the 80s. Now, uh, just a little trivia here. Michael Milken ended up in prison. And when he got out of prison, he stayed away from finance, probably because he's not allowed back. And he started a company called Leap Something Learning, and they had the little frog type toys. Maybe some of you guys had them when you were kids. Did you have one? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can thank Michael Milken, Milken, the junk bond king. Okay, so that's uh, uh, investment versus junk. Let's look at the bond ratings. We're just going to talk about Moody and S&P. Sorry, Fitch. Uh, we're not going to mention Fitch here. But Moody's and S&P's, everybody agrees that a big A, big A, big A rating from S&P is the same as a big A, little A, little A rating from Moody's. We're all in agreement on that. And we also agree that big A, big A from S&P is the same as a big A, little A from Moody's. And so far, you think you've got this in your head, how this is all working, until we get down to B's. We've got big B, big B, big B. And then what does Moody's do? Well, you'd think it would be big B, little B, little B. But no, it's big B, little A, little A. It makes no sense whatsoever, but hey, that's Moody's for you. Okay. Anything in the blue or green is investment Grade. So write that down. Anything in the invest in the blue or green is investment grades, and these things are like uh, grades for undergrads. They have pluses and minuses. Now, just like grades, there's no A plus at Missouri State. There is no AAA plus. AAA is the top. Triple A is the top. But there is triple A minus, which is slightly less good. And then there's double A plus which is slightly less good than triple A minus, and then there's double A, and then there's double A minus, which is slightly better than A plus. And so we got pluses and minuses all through here. Okay, so we know that those uh, blue and green are investment, great, anybody colorblind in here? Okay, good, 
You color blind? Yes, sir. Can you tell the difference? There, there we've got the top four. The top four are investment grade. Everything below there is yeah, junk, right? Junk. Everything below there is junk. And so the bottom five lines are junk. Okay. Now let's talk about what happens um, to, so we remember anybody can invest in investment grade bonds. The entire investor universe is okay to invest in those. But the audience gets smaller, markedly smaller, when we go from investment grade down to being junk because now the institutions, the pension funds, and those people can't buy that stuff. And so it's a much, much bigger step to go from BBB minus down to BB plus than it is to go from BBB to BBB minus because it's that step that pushes you into that junk territory. And once you're pushed into junk territory, that's where you're going to see a big increase in the yield of maturity because now there just aren't as many people um, bidding on your bonds and so you're not going to get as much for each bond and there you go. And so companies really want to be in this investment grade range if they can be. Yes. Oh, you just, oh. Yeah, you gotta be careful. It's like being at the auction, scratching your nose, right? Okay, so let's see. What else do I want to tell you about this? Um, down here at the bottom, uh, these, these go all the way down, and notice that Moody's only has a C. There's nothing below C. And so what is in the S&P 500 labeled as a D? That would also be included in that Moody's C category. So that's the only one that there's not a direct link up. Uh, Moody's C contains both S&P C's and D's. By the way, D equals default. These are bonds that have already missed a coupon payment. D is equal to default, bonds that have already missed a coupon payment. Now my question to you is, would you be interested in buying the defaulted bonds of a company. Ms. Dowden says no. Mr. Murr says maybe. Why, what are you thinking? If you're going to take over the company. Oh, very good. This, this is a bright man. Okay, so if I want to take over a healthy company, I buy its stock. If I want to take over a sick company, I buy its bonds and I wait for it to die. Because when the company goes bankrupt, who takes control of the assets? The bondholders. We call this vulture capitalism. So, over spring break, by the way, this is a bullshit story. Over spring break, my wife and I decided to take a trip out west. And we're driving through Death Valley. You guys know about Death Valley? There's a reason they call it Death Valley, right? Okay, so the car breaks down, we start walking. And we start to notice these birds circling us. These are called vultures. What do vultures do? They're waiting for us to die. By the way, I, I look at the vultures and my wife's like, are those vultures? I'm like, yeah. She says, wow, you think we're gonna die? And I say, you know, I feel okay. Now, who knows this business better? This is my first time dying. The vultures, what, this is like their job every day, right? So if you see this, this is a very bad sign. Okay, so what are they doing? They're waiting for us to die. Now, how does that happen in uh, business? Well, let's talk about Hostess. You guys know Hostess, the makers of Twinkies? A while back, they were in really bad shape. And uh, it was just, you could, everyone could tell that it was like minutes away from being a stinking, rotting corpse. And so what could you do? You go out and you buy as much of their debt as possible, and as soon as they go through bankruptcy, then you take things over. Now, what kind of company would you want to do this with? It has to be someone with a solid business to begin with. So Hostess had a solid business, making this greasy, sweet junk food that Americans love, right? We all, everybody here has been guilty at one point or another of going on a Twinkie Pinch. Okay, so we know this is something that we're all going to be into. It was just the poor management of the firm that had caused it to get into trouble. I'll give you an example. Um, they had uh, multiple unions. 
and they had not just a truck driver union, but they had a union that represented the drivers that take out the little sweet cakes, and then they had a representative uh, or a union that represents the people who deliver the bread. And as a result, the cake people can't deliver bread, and the bread people can't deliver the cakes. This means that they've got two hostess trucks visiting every grocery store every day. Isn't that stupid? That's stupid and inefficient. And this stupid and inefficient management just went through the firm. Now, these managers were stupid enough to make those contracts. They can't get out from under them, but guess what? When you go through bankruptcy, all those union contracts, null and void. And so if you buy the hostess debt and you wait for hostess to die, guess what? You can take back over and uh, now you're starting out as a non-union shop. And if those people want to come back and try to reform their union, of course they're welcome to, but by the way, am I going to try to hire back my old truck drivers? No, I'm going to try to back, hire back new truck drivers, right? So I don't end up with these old ones in there. Or at least ones that profess that they always hated being in the union anyway. And, and by the way, in the end, if I only had one union, I would still be so much better off because now I can send uh, cakes and bread on the same truck. I can save probably half of my logistics. Does that make sense? Okay. Another example of this was a man named Wilbur Ross. He went around and bought up all these bankrupt United States steel corp uh, companies, and he put them into a new company. Now, what had originally destroyed the steel industry in the United States? Well, part of it was the high wages brought about by the union contracts. Well, hey, when Wilbur comes in, those uh, contracts are gone now because those companies have gone bankrupt. So he can come in with a clean slate. And if they don't want to come up with a contract that, that he can live with, he just says, sorry, folks, I'm just going to go out on the street and hire new people. Does that make sense? OK, so that's vulture capitalism. If it's a sick company, you want to go out and buy the bonds. Now, is this worth doing with all sick companies? And the answer is absolutely not. My favorite example of this was Sky Mall. Have you guys ever seen a Sky Mall catalog? This is black. What's Sky Mall? A bunch of weird products that no one would ever buy. And where are you exposed to this? On the airplane. OK, so roll with me back to the mid-90s when I first start traveling for business. Um, back then, a couple of weird things. Number one, we didn't have mobile devices. I know you guys can't believe that, but we didn't have mobile devices. And so if you were going to take a trip on the plane, what did you have to do? You had to bring a book. And what if you ran out of book in mid-flight? Well, then you're going to read the in-flight magazine and learn something new about Ellen DeGeneres, right? And if you run out of, she was around back then too. Um, and if you run out of the in-flight magazine, what do you do next? Sky Mall, right? Now by this time, oh, and by the way, the other thing that was weird is that there were phones in the back of the seat. You guys have probably never even seen that, but there were phones in the back of the seat. And you could, you could swipe your credit card and you could call your mom for like $10 a minute, or you could talk to Michelle at Sky Mall for free. Right? Because that's how you're going to place your order. So there you are. You're on the plane and you're bored and you've had way too much to drink because it's a long flight and you ran out of your novel a long time ago. And so then you're looking at Sky Mall. And they have this bronze life-size Sasquatch. You guys know what Sasquatch is, Bigfoot? That you can order to put in your backyard. And in your state of inebriation, what do you do? You pick up the phone. You're also lonely, by the way. You pick up the phone. You call Michelle at Sky Mall. And she just makes it so easy to go ahead and order that. Now, in the meantime, you have one more drink and pass out, and you forget the whole thing. Six weeks later, because back then things took six weeks to show up, six weeks later, you get a call from your wife. And she says, a big crate showed up today. And you say, huh? And, she, and you say, well, where's it from? And she says, well, it says Sky Mall on it and something about Sasquatch. And suddenly you realize it wasn't a bad dream. You actually ordered Sasquatch. Okay, now let's talk about, and by the way, was it profitable at that point? Yes. Why is it not profitable today? Number one, we have the internet. If you want to find a life-size Sasquatch, you can probably get it on Amazon, right? And by the way, you can get it if two-day shipping. Amazon Prime, woohoo! 
Okay, second thing is um, the uh, phones are gone from the backs of the seats in the airplanes. The third thing is that airlines started looking for ways to save on fuel costs. And the fuel you burn is proportional to the weight of the plane. Well, guess what? What gets thrown out first thing? SkyMall, right? SkyMall, and then of course the in-flight magazines get to be thinner. I mean, there's all sorts of things they did to do that. And so, basically, this is a dead business model. It was so funny, right before they totally died, and of course they've, they've been reborn as a website since then, but before they totally died, the CEO was basically on business television, and he's saying all the stuff that I'm saying right now, and then he catches himself. He says, but we're still confident we can sell it as a going concern. Right, you just told us your business model is dead, right? Would you want to buy the, the defaulted bonds of SkyMall? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I think they were scooped up, uh, and Chinese companies will do this. They'll scoop up a bankrupt American company that has a brand name that people recognize, and they'll do totally other weird things with it. For instance, Bell and Hal. When I was a kid, that was like the film projector in your classroom. Everybody knew who Bell and Hal was. They also made slide projectors. And uh, they went bankrupt somewhere in the 80s or 90s. A Chinese company bought the name, and now they put it on like nose hair trimmers and things. Now, does that have anything to do with the original business? Absolutely not. What's the only value to it? The name. And the same is probably true with SkyMall. Okay, questions? Let's talk about some different types of bonds we had in the United States. Uh, we've got different levels of government. We have our central government, which is called the federal government. And then we have state governments, and then we have local governments. Local governments are counties cities, townships, things like that. And so this big central government, the federal government, issues some different kinds of debt. And they all start with the word treasury because they are issued by the United States Treasury. And the first thing is treasury bills. We've talked about treasury bills before. That's our risk-free asset. Those things have no coupons whatsoever. And so you're like buying these things for $990 in hopes of collecting $1,000 three months from now. That's the game with treasury bills. And then we have treasury notes. Remember that treasury notes are between one and 10 years and they have semi-annual coupons. And those treasury bonds also have semi-annual coupons. Now, one thing I wanna point out is all of the debt of the United States government is unsecured debt. What does it say it's backed by? The full faith and credit of the United States government. So, if we fail to pay the money that we owe China, can China, for instance, take the state of California? No, as much as I might like for them to do that, they can't do that because it's not secured debt. Okay, now, when you buy those kinds of bonds, the interest that you receive is free of state tax. The federal government says, states, you can't touch this interest. You can't. But we will. And so this debt of the United States government, they pay you money, and then they take part of it back in taxes. And at first it sounds a little bit unfair until we get to municipal bonds. Now, municipal bonds are issued by the lower levels of government, like state, county, city, township, that sort of thing. And also special districts, for instance, the Springfield <coughs> School District. When they issue bonds, those are considered municipal bonds. Uh, the local sewage district could issue municipal bonds. And those are free of federal tax and sometimes state tax. Now let's talk why the federal government would make those free of federal tax. Here's the idea. The money that those bonds are used to raise that goes toward usually infrastructure projects, roads, bridges, tunnels, those sorts of things. What do those do to economic development? Yeah, they allow it to grow. I'll give you an example. Um, and this has been a while back. The Chinese used to do a really good job of picking these infrastructure projects. And in China, what happens is that the great majority of people live on the coast, and the great majority of the farmland is inland. And so basically, you have to grow the crops in the middle of the country, and then you have to get them out to the coast to where the population is, because that's who's going to eat the food. But here's the problem. The roads were rough, unreliable. Uh, if there was a rainstorm, you couldn't get past. There was all sorts of problems. 
And so what would happen is that you might start off with a truck full of watermelons, and by the time you got there, only a third of them were worth selling because it had been so long, some of them had spoiled, and some of them had gotten broken in transit. And so it leads to two things. Number one, lower income for the farmers, and number two, higher food costs for the coast dwellers. So what does the Chinese government do? Well, they build highways to get the food from the farm to the cities. And now it's done a couple of things. Number one, the farmers can sell all their watermelons, not just one third of them, but the, uh, they're selling so many of them, they're making more money, even though they're getting slightly less per melon. Remember, that was scarcity of melons earlier. Now the people on the coast have cheaper food and more abundant food. So it's a win-win. So that's the kind of economic development that governments look for when they're doing these infrastructure projects. So that's why the federal government says we're going to let that go and then we will pick up the taxes on the increased economic activity. So not a problem there. Sometimes they're also free of state tax. I live in Missouri. My mother-in-law lives in Arkansas. If I bought a Missouri municipal bond, I would not have to pay Missouri state taxes on it. But if my mother-in-law, who lives in Arkansas, buys the exact same bond, she's going to have to pay Arkansas state taxes on it. On the other hand, if she buys an Arkansas state bond, she will not have to pay state taxes, but if I bought it, I would have to pay taxes to Missouri on the interest that I received from Arkansas. Now, why is it like that? Who knows? I'm sure there's a political argument for it, but basically what it does is limits the pool of people who are willing to buy your debt to the people in your own state. Okay. Now, what does this municipal, uh, this uh, basically lack of taxes do to the yield of maturity? If you remember back to our talk on bearer bonds, we said that people are interested in after tax return. We're interested in that money that we have left to spend after this is all said and done. If a bond does not force you to pay taxes, then every bit of money you get from it is after tax return. But if a bond is taxed, I've got to multiply that return times 1 minus the tax rate to figure out what is that after tax rate. And so this, this uh, formula right here, I sub n, is the interest rate on an otherwise identical municipal bond. And it's going to be equal to the interest rate on a taxable bond multiplied by 1 minus t. But here's the funky thing. t is the investor's marginal tax rate. T is the investor's marginal tax rate. Is that the same for everybody? No. And so what happens here is that municipal bonds that are uh, offering, say, 6% might be attractive to some people but not to others. So, for instance, um, I'll, I'll use my brother-in-law as an example. Great guy. He has a good, solid job. But here's the trick. Uh, there are all these tax credits for having kids. And he has a big, uh, a big family. And so basically, he doesn't have to pay any taxes. Now, would he be interested in a bond that paid 8% tax? Uh, would he be more interested in a taxable 8% bond or a 6% municipal bond? Remember, he doesn't pay any taxes. His marginal tax rate is zero. Which one's he going to choose? He's going to choose the taxable bond because the after tax and before tax are exactly the same for him because he basically has a zero marginal tax rate. Now, what about someone who has the highest marginal tax rate in the country, 39.6? Let's round it up to 40. So 1 minus t would be 0 0.6. 1 minus 0.4 is 0 0.6. 0 0.6 times that same 8% is 4.8%. Which would they rather have, a taxable bond that gave them a 4.8% after-tax return or a 6% municipal bond? Yeah, the 6% municipal bond. And we know that the tax rates in this country are progressive, meaning that the higher your level of income is, the higher your marginal tax rate. So we can say that rich people will be interested, people with high incomes will be interested in municipal bonds and people that don't pay tax, for whatever reason, 
and groups that don't pay tax. For instance, charities, pension funds. If you ever see your pension fund invested in municipal bonds, there's something dreadfully wrong with the person that's managing it. Okay, now, this is a true story. When we first moved to Springfield, we had what was called a landline. Some of you may remember these. It was where the phone was hooked into the wall with a cable. And the phone rang, and I picked it up. And the guy said, this is so-and-so from Edward Jones. You guys know who Edward Jones is? Yeah, it's a brokerage. And he says, I'd like to talk to you about municipal bonds. I say, just a minute. And I cover the mouthpiece of the phone, and I turn to my wife, and I say, honey, we've made it. Edward Jones thinks we make enough money to care about municipal bonds. What, what does that mean Edward Jones thinks about our annual income? They must think it's pretty high or we wouldn't be interested in these things. Does that make sense? Okay, I tell you that story to drill it into your head that uh, it's rich people that benefit from these most. Now, by the way, I had some inside information that Edward Jones didn't. And so I just hung up, right? Okay, questions? Let's cover this and we'll be done here. Actually, no, I'm not, I don't have enough time to do that. So here's what we're going to do. Next time we're going to do what we hope to do today, finish chapter five, start chapter six, and then I will push the homework seven out until after Tuesday of next week. So keep an eye out for that. And I'll tell you about that on Tuesday.